in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is more information there than most people would ever realize. I was eight years old and my parents wanted to take me to the workshop of Thomas Edison. On the drive back home, I said to my dad, I want to be an inventor. Light, as it turns out, is the primary control mechanism for everything else that happens in the body. What if we could have an external electromagnetic field that would essentially reset the stem cells that are already in our bodies and get them to function like younger, healthier cells? What if in the process, we actually found out that in a book that was written thousands of years ago, that information already existed? God has left his fingerprint in natural design, and that blueprint shows up in nature. The mathematical codes are identical. The implications to this are absolutely extraordinary. What drives me is that there's this enormous sense of hope that we can create technology to generate clean energy, that we can have foods that aren't genetically modified, and we can meet all of the needs on the planet that we have to, and that we can heal people. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to meet the brightest light, one of the very brightest lights I've met in my life, and certainly the brightest light that I've met in over a decade. I know David Schmidt is a bright light to each and every one of you in this room. And so, I would like to bring an innovator, an inventor, a creator, a person who pours his life into all of us to make the world a better place and to help us to be that guiding light for millions of people around this world. Please help me welcome to the stage our founder, our CEO, David Schmidt. Thank you very much. Thank you. You all have a great time last night? <laughs> okay. I'm going to start off. I have a confession to make. My wife's very nervous. It is incredibly... really difficult. Every year, my mother-in-law will ask me, what do you want for Christmas? Every year, I say to her the same thing. I want world peace. And she'll say, you know, <laughs> that's a tall order, but, but I'm, obsess I'm obsessed with this idea that is there a way we could get human beings to stop trying to kill each other? That's it. Really simple. How do we do that? So for years, we have been stimulating the body with light. That's how these patches work. We gently stimulate the body with light and we produce these amazing effects. But what if, what if we could take light inside of our body? What if there was a way we could create a technology 
that would release light from within. Today, you're going to see that technology. This day, this weekend, marks the next generation of LifeWave. The first 20 years have all been about LifeWave technology and patches. Now we are going to expand on that. Instead of just stimulating the body with light, we are going to explore an entirely new generation of light therapy technology. So, what benefits could we expect to see from this? First thing is, this technology is an entirely new way to elevate NAD. So at least some of you know that, what that is. So NAD is a key molecule involved in age reversal. And it is an energy carrying molecule within the cell. If we can elevate NAD, we can turn on energy production, we can reset genes to a more youthful state. The next thing that we find with this technology is that we can support healthy levels of human growth hormone, keeping us young and healthy. We can regain and build new strength, stamina, and muscle with this. And the results are really shocking about how quickly this happens. When we're ramping up energy production, we are supporting the natural healing process. And you're going to see that one of the things that we can do with this is turn on the production of collagen. And ultimately, we will use this technology to stay younger longer. So increasing NAD, supporting growth hormone levels, more strength and muscle, natural healing, and living younger, longer. These are five new benefits that are all coming from one new machine. So today, you are going to meet our new LifeWave water technology. There is a lot of information that we're going to present. I'm going to go through some of this very quickly. Uh, so if you want to take pictures, feel free to do that. So how do we go about and create an entirely new technology surrounding water? There have been structured water products that have already been on the market for many years. We can add different types of minerals to water. We can change the surface tension of water. Is there anything else new that we could do that would be meaningful? Well, let's take a look and start at the very beginning and talk about composition of matter. So this is the periodic table. Each of the elements, you can think of it as a building block. So this is what we have to work with in the spectra of creating new materials. Let's start with something very simple. Let's start with tin. Tin is a relatively simple element. It's used in electronics. And pretty much everything that someone who is a chemist or a physicist would want to know about tin is already well known. We take tin and we combine it with oxygen in the presence of heat, and we get a tin oxide. Nothing entirely remarkable about this. It's extremely well known. But we created a device in our lab. I have multiple patents on this now. And we expose the tin and the oxygen to a very special type of electromagnetic and longitudinal field. And this will change the bond angle between the oxygen and the tin, creating something that looks like gold and creating a material that never existed before. Yeah. 
And here's the really interesting part. By changing the frequencies or changing the wavelengths of light that we work with, we can change the bond angle. Now, when you have light reflecting off of a surface, that's how you're going to get color. And so by changing the bond angle, we change the angle at which light is going to reflect off that surface. And as a result, we can change the color. So we've made these metals that look like gold, orange, red, blue, purple just by changing and manipulating the matter with frequencies of energy. So we did something really fun. We created a LifeWave 20th anniversary coin from this material that never existed before, and we gave this coin to our qualified senior presidential directors. Okay, so very quickly, here is a laboratory report that we did. So when we are going to run these tests, how do we know that this ma material never existed before? Well, quite simply, uh, we hired a laboratory. We used a technique called X-ray diffraction. We sent the material out, and it came back, as you can see here, unknown phase. So they compared this material to 60,000 other materials and found out that it had never existed before. And there's, you can see a peak on the left that's showing that it's novel and unique. And then here is a laboratory report, no tin or tin oxide reference patterns matched this phase. So a unique novel material. Okay. So here's the important thing, is that uh, these experiments showed that we could manipulate matter with energy. We could create new matter. That's an extraordinarily powerful tool. So the question is, what are we going to do uh, with this new technology? What frequencies would we use and why? That's a pretty good question. We should have a mathematical model for this. My dad is a music teacher, so I grew up around music. Um, and when we look at the musical scale, we see the musical scale is based off of 440 hertz tuning. And so if we were to look at the frequencies which are associated with the musical scale, we can see them listed over here. And you'll notice immediately this is a little bit unusual, right? Why do we have all of these odd numbers. It looks very, very random. Um, and we see that this musical scale came in 1834 from the German, nat uh, German natural scientists. Seems kind of unusual that they would create this 440 hertz tuning. Well, is there a way that we could mathematically extrapolate what musical tuning should be based on? So let's do this. We take a chart, and on the vertical column, we're going to put the number two, horizontal column, we're going to take the number three. And all we're going to do is we're going to double the num numbers on the vertical column, and we're going to triple the numbers over on the horizontal column. And then we're going to take the product of each. So in other words, two times three is six, four times three is 12, and so forth. And we continue to fill out these columns this way. Okay. Now, as we're creating this chart, we get to the number 432. So 432 is very close to 440. So let's see if we could create a musical scale based on 432 hertz instead of 440 hertz. Thank you. <laughs> Wasn't my idea, but I appreciate it anyway. Now, here's another thing uh, that's very interesting. I have a friend, uh, Terry McGrath, who is a uh, physicist, and uh, he has a patent called the Physical Quantum Atomic Model of the Atom. And in that model, an atom, you never heard of that before? <laughs> my only one that did the homework. My goodness. Okay. 
So 108 is the number of resonant nodes within an atom. So this starts to make sense. In other words, if you want to affect matter, you should have a model that allows for manipulating the atom with resonance. And that would be based on 108 hertz or 108 nodes within the atom. So this started to look very promising. So now we have our existing musical scale based on 440, and now we look over at 432. What would that look like? So we just simply go to our chart, and we fill it out based on the frequencies that are in each column. So in other words, when you take the column based, when you take the vertical column based on two, or the horizontal row based on three, and then you multiply that and get the product, what you end up with, each column represents a different musical note. And everything fits perfectly. And of course, in music, we have a note A at 432. If we go up an octave, the next frequency is 864. Or, of course, we can take any harmonic of that. So it could be 108, 256, 432, 864, and so forth. So there's our new musical scale. So how can we apply this information? Well, here's what we did. We created this device called a double helix conductor. And if we're going to try to work with the natural world, then let's have a electromagnetic field that nature would use. So in this case, a double helix, DNA. So the idea <clears throat> was that we were gonna take these musical notes and musical frequencies and plug them through this device and see if we could have any effect on matter. So one of the things we wanna do is heal people faster. We wanna increase protein synthesis. So at the time, we were in California. And as it turns out, when you're in California and you wanna grow plants, there's a number of companies that are very interested in accelerating the growth rate of plants. <laughs> it's very easy to work with these companies and do experiments. So that's what we did. If I could do a Bill Clinton impersonation now, I never smoked, never inhaled, or however that goes. That was terrible. That was more like Trump. That wasn't Clinton. All right. I'm not going to do a Trump impression, honey, don't worry. <laughs> so this is what we did. We had our control group. They kind of look like Christmas trees. Uh, <clears throat> and we have our treatment group. And you can see right away what we found was that exposing these plants to these energy fields increased the rate of protein synthesis. This is extremely important. And we can see if we look at this and treat an entire column of plants, we can get this effect. So commercially, this has a value. Now, of course, we want to apply this to human beings. So we did this work uh, at the National University of Ireland in Galway, and we worked with the uh, Regenerative Medicine Institute, um, Dr. Tim O'Brien. And this was an experiment that we did with rabbits. So these rabbits, had diabetic ulcerations, we applied this field, and right away, we found that we could accelerate the rate of repair in this open wound using this technology. So this was the first evidence that we had, that there was a way that you could, without any stem cells injections, without any drugs, just using energy, you could accelerate the way that people would heal. So, our focus now, of course, we went through many years uh, of selling X39 and doing multiple studies on X39, showing how it activates stem cells and improves healing. Now, our goal is a little bit different. We're still interested in accelerating the rate at which people heal, but now what we want to look at is, can we apply these techniques to longevity? Can we stop 
the human aging process. Can we keep people younger longer? How are we going to do this? And are there any examples in nature? So one of the things that we did is uh, we take a biomimetic view, meaning we want to look to nature and see if we can copy nature and create new technology. So one of the uh, examples that we used were temnothorax ants. Temnothorax ants, they get infected with a parasite, and as a result, it alters their gene expression, so they overexpress cytochrome C oxidase, and as a result, mitochondrial function gets upregulated. They end up producing more ATP. And in the process, they live five to six times longer than normal. So could we apply this technology? So here was the control group. We took a, a gel and a growth media that's used for cultivating ants, and we populated uh, the media with ants. So they went to work producing tunnels. Then we took our treatment group and we exposed them to this energy field. And that's what happened. So we were able to show that we could take a mechanical device and transfer energy from that device over to a living system where it would increase the energy in the ant and the ant could end up doing more useful work. So this is very key because what we know from other experiments is that if you can increase the amount of energy that's available in a living system, gene expression changes to a more youthful state. So what does this have to do with human beings? Well, this is a link now and a missing piece in longevity. As people age, the amount of energy in their cells decline, mitochondrial dysfunction. So if we can have a technology that can reverse that, we can at minimum keep people younger longer. The next model that we went to was working with lobsters. And as it turned out, the technology that you're going to see today is based off of how lobsters completely defy the aging process. Now, I have another confession to make. When we first built this equipment in our lab, I have a lot of really talented engineers that I work with, and we were setting all of this up and going through all these trials and we got the first drops of this new water coming out of the machine, I said, I've done it. I've created lobster water. <laughs> and so I was telling Meredith about this, and I was talking to Wayne about this, and I said, guys, this is incredible. We have this new technology. I call it lobster water. It's going to revolutionize health. And Meredith said, question, is it too late to change the name? Needless to say, your product will not be called lobster water. <laughs> but it is the key to bringing light into the body. And let's go to the video. For those curious about the intersection of science, faith, and naturalism, there sure are some fascinating conversations and facts out there that speak to the concept of intelligent design, the debate on God's existence, the age of the earth, unfathomable mathematical coincidences, Bible codes, and more. For instance, with over 11 million followers on YouTube, Destin Sandlin from Smarter Every Day recently visited Vanderbilt University to do research with his camera rolling on the existence of something called the flagellar motor. The implications for a biomechanical motor are insane. 
Think this bacteria is somehow moving just to move? Think again. This bacteria has an operating system. Yeah. It has sensors. Yeah. It has uh, it has effectors, it has yes, actuators, exactly, yeah. and it has feedback. Yeah, and feedback. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but, but it's, because it, it's so, uh, it, it's a neat design, is what it, I'll say. It is, it is. And it is all made out of molecules and looks like a sophisticated biomechanical motor that only recently was brought into focus through intense magnification imaging and modeled by the School of Pharmacology at Vanderbilt. It's made up of molecules and is hereby chance? So the flagellar motor exists, and it's amazing. It's complex, and it reminds me of an electric motor, and I love it. Like, I love this thing, and I think it's incredible. There are implications for the fact that something so complex exists and is so integral to the creation of human life. I mean, this is fascinating stuff. So it also uh, opens up a huge debate. People say, well, how can something this complex come to be out of nothing? The logic goes like this. If this motor system is composed of complex individual parts, and all these parts work together to perform the overall function of rotating, then how did the individual parts come to be? Did it all have to happen at the same time? What were the steps these components took to assemble into such a complex molecular machine in the first place? Okay, so let's talk about for a moment if we seriously want to take on this subject of human aging and we want to look at is it biologically possible to stop aging and hopefully someday reverse it, is there any evidence that this could possibly exist? Well, what's so interesting is that when we go back to 2018, when we had the start of the release of X39, we knew that this was going to mobilize stem cells in the body, that this was going to support natural healing, it was going to turn on energy production, help to regulate inflammation in the body, support overall natural healing. We started to see testimonials where it looked like people were becoming younger. Here was one example. One person likes that. <laughs> 5,000 people like that. So we started to see this evidence that as people began using X39, they showed physical signs of becoming younger. And it, in some cases, the ro results were dramatic. It certainly wasn't that case with everyone. I wish it was, but it wasn't that case with everyone. But we did have dramatic testimonials like this. So the question is, what's going on here? What can we learn and can we come up with technology to apply this to everyone? Because it certainly looks like it's possible to at least reverse part of the aging process. And certainly, copper peptide will do that. So let's take a look through the literature. And this is fascinating. I've used this example before, but it's worth emphasizing again. Oxytocin. Oxytocin is the hormone that we associate with love. It's the hormone that's released when a woman gives birth, so it allows for bonding between, I was going to say a woman. Is that okay to say these days? I think it's okay, right? Yeah. I'm going to say it anyway because I know there's men and women. Um, and a woman is a woman. Okay. As a matter of fact, I think you should elect me to the Supreme Court because I can say what a woman is. Okay, all right, anyway. <laughs> so that's what it, how it works. Um, now here's the really interesting thing though about oxytocin, is that if we take old muscle tissue, 
and we expose it to oxytocin, it will have a rejuvenation effect on that muscle tissue. So the muscle fibers begin to look like and resemble young, healthy tissue. So this can't happen unless we're having an effect on the genes. Now we can understand this from uh, the perspective of biochemistry. So when we're in a state of love, there's a state of reduced stress, anxiety, the body's calm, we're conserving antioxidants, there's less inflammation in the body. And ultimately, when we're not in a chronic state of inflammation, that means we're protecting our DNA. So it's kind of easy to understand on this on a biochemical process when we're thinking of prevention, but when we're thinking about age reversal, that's an entirely different subject. There's more going on here than simple biochemistry. So let's see if we can understand that. So let's take a look at lobsters. We're going to use lobsters as a biological model. And lobsters are able to defy aging. There have been lobsters that have been found that are over 130 years old. And lobsters don't age during that process. So if you were to examine the muscle of the lobster that's 130, it would look like it is young and healthy. There's no type of oxidative stress, no inflammatory stress, no signs of aging whatsoever. In fact, as lobsters get older, they get stronger. So we want to understand this. They're not going to die due to old age. Lobsters will be killed by a predator like human beings. They're going to get sick. Um, or they're going to outgrow their shells. Those are the mechanisms in which a lobster is going to meet their end. But it doesn't happen through normal aging. So when scientists look at an explanation in the scientific literature, the prevailing theory is that this all has to do with the telomeres. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is based on telomere biology, meaning that telomeres are the rods on the end of chromosomes, and they're going to control the number of cell divisions. So as we age, as human beings age, these telomere rods get shorter and shorter until finally we're in our 70s, and our cells can no longer multiply and divide. In lobsters, that process never happens. Lobsters, their cells will continue to divide an infinite number of times. So, of course, humans have these telomeres, and one of the searches today in telomere biology is to look for either a drug or a naturally occurring material that can keep the telomeres lengthened. So, all that information is true. However, what we found in our research is that this was not the whole story. It was part of the story, but it doesn't explain everything. So, what if there's more going on here? Let's see what we can learn. What if there is some natural living code that's responsible for the lobster's immortality? We already know that everything in the body is controlled by light. It's the way we were created, it's the way we were designed, and it's very easy to prove scientifically. The electromagnetic systems in the body, the electrical systems in the body, control the biochemistry. So there must be a way to tap into this. How are the lobsters using their energy fields to prevent aging? That's what we want to know. So since we are in the business of treating the body with light, a valuable tool is spectrophotometry. Spectrophotometry is going to measure the energy that is absorbed or reflected or emitted by a material. And depending on the device, 
This will happen in the uh, UV, visible, or the IR spectra. So we get our light source, it goes through a lens to help focus this, we get a spectra of light, and then we look to see uh, when we're testing a material, how that material responds to these different wavelengths of light. So another question is, if we're going to look for the secret of longevity in a lobster, where are we going to look? So we have a research tool to do the examination, but where are we going to find the secret? Well, we can look to the Bible, because the Bible is going to contain uh, incredible information. We go to the book of Genesis, and we go to the story of Noah. So there's evil upon the earth, and we could probably learn from this lesson today. There's evil upon the earth. God re regrets creating human beings and wants to wipe everything out and start over, but he finds that Noah is righteous, and Noah is the one good man and his family on the planet. So Noah and his family are going to be saved. So we all know the story. So what's interesting here is how human lifespan changes in the Bible. As a matter of fact, there is a statistical analysis on this which shows that if you take the ages of people in the Bible as it's represented through these generations, that it forms a statistically significant decay curve. In other words, those ages were not in the Bible as a random number. They're an accurate representation of exactly what happened. And so what can we learn from this? Well, God says to Noah, okay, now you can go and eat the flesh of animals. So presumably, uh, before the flood, People were vegans, we're eating fruits and vegetables, but now we're going to go ahead and eat the flesh of animals, but don't eat the blood, because the life is in the blood. So what if we were to take that literally? What if there was something in blood that hadn't been discovered? We all know what blood is meant to do, but maybe there's something else there that's been overlooked. So let's take a look. Um, for lobster blood, there's a number of different varieties. And we turn to this scientist that's an expert, Robert Baer. And he's been studying lobsters his entire life. And we had a very interesting conversation with him. And uh, one of the things that came out of this was that lobster hemolymph uh, was being used as a treatment for COVID-19. And lobster blood is based on copper, of course. So what's hemocyanin? Hemocyanin is a copper-containing protein. So lobsters are the Vulcans on this planet. For all you Star Trek fans. Ah, so happy we got some Star Trek fans here today. Okay, a lot of Star Trek fans, all right. So, of course, we can't help but notice that in human beings, GHK is bound to copper, and that will reset about one-third of the human genome to a younger state. So I think it's fair to say, would a similar mechanism be going on in lobsters? It does the copper content have anything to do with the longevity. So we could look there, and what's the connection? So we pull up this research study uh, that's done by Professor Joseph Kunkel. That's a big lobster. I'm not sure if it's just coming out of a broiler, though. I think it's alive, but I'm not sure. That would feed a lot of people. Uh, and here's what the spectrophotometry chart is going to look like on this. And I started to notice when I looked at this data that there were these peaks that were going on at uh, 550 
nanometers and 400 nanometers. So the visible spectra is between 400 and 700 nanometers. Anything under 400 is up in the UV range. Below 700 is in the infrared range. And you can see that there's these interesting effects that occur where these three different samples intersect between 700, 710 nanometers, and 525 nanometers. Okay, I know this is getting technically boring, uh, but there's a reason why we want to go through this. So a moment ago, we were talking about musical scale and 432 hertz. So we did these experiments, and we showed that if we put music, essentially, into these electromagnetic coils that we could accelerate the way the people healed. What does this have to do with wavelengths of light in lobster blood? Is there any possible connection? So the immediate thing that we notice is that if we start with a 432 based tuning and then we double the number, we're going up in octaves. So here's what I did. I took 432, and you continue to double it. And you can also put this into a uh, online calculator for converting frequency over to wavelength. So there's a number of ways to make this calculation, but basically you can convert a musical note over to a wavelength of light. So that's what I did here. And we end up with 400, when you do the calculation, you end up with 432 hertz equal to approximately 631 nanometers. Now, I'll tell you why that's interesting. It's interesting because in the scientific literature, 630 nanometer light is one of the wavelengths of light that's used to turn on mitochondrial function. And 440 hertz is not. All musical instruments should be turned to, tuned to 432 hertz because it is harmonic with the human body. It actually promotes energy and healing. Alternatively, we can use 630 nanometer light to turn on mitochondrial function. But we're still going to, if we do that, we're still going to be stimulating the outside of the body. And the patches are still superior in this sense because we can turn on specific peptides in the body that you can't with normal light. But this is a very powerful piece of information. So let's take a look at this. So we go back to our lobster data. And now we have 550 nanometers is one wavelength of light that's coming off of lobster blood. 630 nanometers, we took that number based off of 432 hertz tuning because that's what we were using in our experiments. And my hypothesis was that 630 nanometer light is in the lobster, we just didn't detect it in the lobster blood. So I had that hypothesis. And then the other uh, wavelength of light was somewhere on the chart, it would be somewhere between 700 and 709 nanometers, roughly. Those are the wavelengths we we're working with. So this was uh, my first invention that came off this process. I call it a biophotonic reflector and ended up getting several patents on this. And if you look inside uh, this device, uh, you'll see that we have uh, a series of optical filters, very uh, high precision optical filters, along with an optical grade mirror. So essentially, we take the light, the naturally occurring biophoton emissions from the human body, they pass through the filters, hit the mirror, and then come back to the human body, but only specific wavelengths of light stimulate the surface of the skin. So that was the idea behind this. Let's see if we could treat the surface of the skin with the same wavelengths of light that are responsible for keeping lobsters young. Did that make sense? Okay, that was the objective. 
we got two to three years of age reversal in 10 minutes. And the way we measured this was through looking at the cell capacitance, the size of the cells. So a measure of how cells age is in their size. As we age, the cells will begin to shrink. And the electrical charge of the cell will start to become smaller. It's one of the, one of the mechanisms that's not well known about how a healthy cell goes and becomes cancerous tissue and how ultimately uh, cancer can be treated naturally. But that's a different subject. So we can correlate aging to the electrical charge around the cell. So when you use this device, the cells expand, cells become younger. But it's almost too rapid. So we wanted to look for other methods here. Now let's go back to this idea that we can use technology to create new forms of matter. Maybe we could take some of those experiments that we did and apply it to this new knowledge that we have. If we were going to create new matter, what would we do? Hydrogen, as it turns out, has a metallic state. So, of course, we're familiar with hydrogen and water, but if we just take hydrogen, of course, it's a gas. We can compress hydrogen and turn it into a liquid. And, of course, that's a cryogenic material. But what's not well known is that hydrogen can actually exist as a metal. So if we go back to these experiments and we say, okay, we took different types of metal. We took bismuth, copper, tin, aluminum, antimony. We put them into the presence of oxygen, exposed them to light and these electromagnetic fields, and we created new matter. What if... We could take water and we could break it into hydrogen and oxygen, treat hydrogen like a metal, recombine the hydrogen and oxygen in the presence of a catalyst using a specific type of energy and reassemble it into a new form of water that never existed before. That was the hypothesis. So if we could achieve this, what it would literally mean is that if we could do it, we could create a new type of water that had photons of light embedded into the bonds of the water so that when you drank the water, it would release that light into the body. That was the goal here. And that's how we got from where we started to where we are now in this presentation. So... I built this machine that was about, it was a great Tony Stark moment for me. Uh, it was maybe about three feet wide and about nine feet long. And um, we started getting drops of water coming out of this thing. And it was incredible to see it for the first time. But it was, it was so slow, so, it was so painful. But we did it. So everyone knows what ice looks like. Here's a beaker of distilled water where we freeze it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this new water and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to freeze it. So why do we want to freeze it? Well, it's a phase change. Another hypothesis here is that as water goes from being a, a liquid to a solid, in chemistry, that's a phase change. So can we see whether or not the light in the water is going to be released when the water changes state? Because that would represent a change in the bond angle. So it would make sense to me that the, that the light would be released during that process. And that would be a really great thing because it would mean that once the water gets into the body, the water will phase change and release the light. So let's see what happens. We started freezing it and we started to notice these highly coherent threads of water crystals. So this was important because we know that 
if you were to um, have a structured water, the water is highly organized. So we start to see some evidence here. And sorry, I had skipped ahead one. Okay, now we're good. Um, when the water freezes completely, really interesting things happen. We get a vortex funnel that occurs at the center of the beaker. And of course, we associate vortexes with natural energy and living systems. If you look at the beaker from uh, underneath, again, you can see this implosion that occurs as the water crystals move towards the center as compared to the control. As you change the wavelengths of light that we use to treat the water, different shapes start to appear, living shapes start to appear. In some samples, they resemble an egg. And what do we think about eggs? Eggs are life. And depending on the type of water that we use and the treatment and the amount of treatment time, we get an increase in the density of the number of water threads. So what this means is that we can control how much light is in the water through the settings. You probably would like to see this now, right? Okay. We're going to watch now a time-lapse video that we took. What we did in our lab was we took a, a freezer. Okay, we're going to play it. So just watch it. We have our freezer, and that is a glass front. We have a time-lapse camera. So you're seeing uh, this water sample being frozen over a period of uh, about four or five hours. So normal ice on the left, and there's our nice vortex funnel and implosion of water on the right. Okay, what do you think? And then sometimes really weird things will happen when we're playing with the settings on the machine. Sometimes we'll, we will get these pylons that will rise out of the water and we get all different types of shapes. Uh, my daughter Kelly, who's in our lab, this is her project. She's done a phenomenal job uh, on these experiments. And uh, she calls this a strawberry. So she's making strawberries out of ice in the lab. So now that we have created a new form of water, uh, the question is, and by the way, this is patented already, uh, this was a very quick patent for us. So we'll have uh, just filed another four patents on this. We'll have over 20 patents on this technology uh, by the time we're done. So we need to be able to determine if there's any benefits from drinking this water. We've, now we've created this new form of water, never existed before. Now we want to know if there's any longevity benefits. But what happened next, I think, was even more incredible. We had created this new water, never existed before. We did it from using a piece of equipment that has only been around since the 1950s, spectrophotometry. So prior to 1950s, there would have been no way to figure out what wavelengths of light lobsters were emitting, which was fundamental to this discovery. What I found, though, what I didn't expect, is that the same codes, the same living codes that I used to create this technology were found in a book from 5,000 years ago. The key to this discovery was already in the Bible. Let's go to the video. You know that if you find an Indian arrowhead in a cave, archaeologists will immediately say, oh, 
intelligence has been here. They carved this Indian arrowhead. But then you point to DNA, which is the most complex information system, language system in the entire universe that makes up our chromosomes, our genes, all the information that builds a human or a dog or a cat or whatever. And secularists, secular scientists will say, oh, chance, chance, chance. You know what DNA is? It's like a complex information system. You see, life is built on information. Do you know how much information there is in living systems on this planet? It's not billions. It's not trillions. It's actually zillions of bits of information. And you know what? You've got to have a language to read the information. Do you know DNA not only has an incredible amount of information in it, but it also has the information to make a language to read the information. If you're going to read a book and it's in Russian, you need to know the Russian code or language or you can't read it. Actually, the word mathematics did not mean the science of quantity until Aristotle. At Plato's time and before that, mathematics just meant learning. That's why the word polymath just means many, poly, learning. So it was synonymous with all learning because mathematics was just the language of all learning. You know, another thing people don't realize is this was an age Greeks didn't have numbers like we have. They used letters to describe their numbers. So the letter alpha was the number one. The letter, you know, beta was the number two. And this was true also in Hebrew, in Phoenician, all the ancient languages. Mm -hmm. They were all using their letters to represent their numbers. It wasn't until we had the benefit of having uh, the Arabs come up with the Arabic numeral system, right? And we got all the numbers that we currently have. But when you think about that, that means that all of the things that were written had both a literary meaning and a mathematical meaning. And this is what, there's a whole study of this that people have long ignored, which is called gematria, right? And so there are hidden codes within the Bible that people that study this stuff swear by because they can find these hidden codes inside of it because that's the way it was written in the first place. Okay. So let's take a look at this. And if we're going to look in the Bible, let's start right in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So what information could possibly be there where we could learn something new that isn't already self-evident? Well, there is, as it turns out, more information there in this one simple sentence than we might normally think. So let's look at it. First of all, in the beginning, we can think of this as representing the concept of time, past, present, future. God created the heaven. Well, heaven is kind of everything around us. That's space, length, width, and height. And the earth, that represents matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma. So here in this first sentence, we have the very foundation of everything around us. And actually, this is quite consistent with how we might think of the start of everything. So in other words, God is outside of normal space and time. There's this event called the Big Bang, if that's how everything really began, and then all matter and everything around us came from that. And in this one sentence, those, all those concepts are there. But let's dig a little bit further. So we're going to look at the book of Genesis in the Hebrew because we can convert Hebrew over to a numerical code. We can convert the letters over into numbers and we can convert the words over into numbers. So if we were to look at, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. In Hebrew, this is what we would see. And we see something very interesting. There's seven words here, and there's gonna be three words to the left of center, three words to the right of center. That center word can't really be translated into English, not completely. So we have five letters to the left and right of center, and the second words have three letters. Okay, that's a little interesting. Let's take a look at this another way and use the numerical values.
first, let's go back one slide. Because actually there was something here I wanted to show you that wasn't here. We can look at this as being a ratio. Three words out of seven, or seven words and then three. Three, seven, seven, three. Those numbers mirror one another. Oops, try that again. Okay, so we're gonna convert these letters and words over into numbers now, and this is what it's gonna look like. So far, they just look like numbers, and nothing really much more about that. Oh, there's our 3773, my mistake. Okay, so we got these seven words total, three on the left, three on the right. Now, let's just start someplace, and let's add all of these numbers together. We come up with 2,701. Okay, so far, Nothing really remarkable about that, apparently. However, 2,071 is 37 times 73. 3773. And I want you to remember that 3773 because later on it's going to become very important because it was foundational to a discovery I made. 37 happens to be the 12th prime number, 73 is the 21st prime number. One, two, two, one. Those numbers mirror one another. Maybe there's something about that that we're supposed to pay attention to. Now, let's have a little bit of fun with this and start to combine some of the different words. What might we find? Well, let's take God, the earth, and the heaven as a concept and add those numbers together. We get the number 777. Interesting, does it mean anything? Now let's say God and the heaven. That equals 888. Now let's take in the beginning God. And as you might expect, that is 999. So we start to see a pattern begin to form. As an inventor, I'm always looking for patterns. I'm looking for patterns in nature because those patterns are not there by accident. There has to be a meaning behind it. So if the Bible is indeed the inspired word of God, then what you would expect from a being that created everything is that God would have to be the ultimate scientist, physicist, inventor, creator, and that God would put a mathematical code into the Bible for people to discover so we could believe. But maybe it's also an instruction manual. What about that? So I looked at these numbers and I thought, let's go back and look at 3773 again. So 777 is 37 times 7 times 3. That's kind of interesting. 888 is 37 times 8 times 3. And 999, 37 times 3 times 3 times 3. This is starting to not look like a coincidence. And these numerical codes are only the beginning because you see these numerical codes throughout the Bible. But what does this have to do with lobster blood? Is there any connection there? So we go back to these wavelengths of light. What we had already seen was that 550 nanometers, 630 nanometers, and 700 to 710 nanometers, when we created this biophotonic reflector, we found it was capable of at least in part reversing part of human aging. So we have in the book of Genesis the story of creation the story of human beings, and then ultimately the fall of man. 
So you might expect if there's a mathematical code in the Bible, in the story of creation, we might find that same mathematical code in nature. But you can see that these numbers are not the same as 777-888-999. So on the surface, well, there doesn't seem to be a pattern there, but wait, 3773, what if instead of that just describing the number of words and the way those words are arranged in the book of Genesis, what if it's a ratio? What if what God is trying to tell us is you need to look at the ratio of these numbers? So that's what I did. Let's take a look at that. There's our biblical code, there's our lobster code. 777 divided by 888 is 0.875. 999 divided by 888 is 1.125. So we're gonna take 631 nanometers at the center over here on our wavelengths, multiply it by 0.875 and we find about 550 nanometers. When we're working with light, if we're within three to five nanometers of a target, it's considered relevant. And when we're looking at spectrophotometry data, that is about the tolerance that we work with. We take 631, multiply it by 1.125, and there is our 710 nanometers. So the implication to this is pretty extraordinary. It shows that there is a math mathematical sequence of numbers that aren't there, that's arbitrary. And this ratio, same ratio can be found in living systems. Or Spock would say, it literally is Genesis. Um, <laughs> Okay, what movie was that from? Anybody know? Star Trek what? Which Star Trek movie? One, two, three, four, five, six. Star Trek two, come on. I know my friend Matt over here knows the answer. He's just not saying anything. Okay, so what does this all mean? Well, I think in simple terms, we can say that the Bible is a historical document. If you were to speak with a Hebrist, they would say it's definitely a historical account. It's written as a historical account of things that actually occurred. So it means as that reference, we can learn from it. But because we can convert the words over into numbers, we can look for patterns there and we can learn from them. And this is all just the beginning. They're, there, they're not there by accident. So, it is to me evidence that the Bible is the inspired word of God. But I want you to think about this and let's go a step further. God creates all living things. Then these codes, they show up in nature. So as you would expect in our natural world that there is going to be intent and intelligent design when it comes to all living systems. So as you saw in the video, we even have molecular motors, molecular machinery that is in our body. Things that are highly complex that 100, 200 years ago was never even ex expected to have existed but it does exist. And we can use this information to create new technology that never existed before. And we're really just getting started with this. So God creates all things, and like an artist, God signs his fingerprint in nature, leaving it there for us to find. So this is incredibly exciting to me because it means that when the Bible was written thousands of years ago, they didn't have modern technology like spectrophotometry where they could 
analyze lobster blood and then say, oh, okay, we're going to write the book of Genesis so it lines up with lobster blood, <laughs> right? That didn't happen. God creates all living things, and this pattern is in our very DNA. It's the makeup of who we are, and it means as a race, we're all united. We're all human beings. We shouldn't be fighting and killing each other. We should be, un be uniting with one another. Now, there's something else that goes with this. As you might expect, I looked other places in the Bible, and the next one that I went to was the Tree of Life. So I'm going to be talking about this more. I'm actually running a little bit ahead, which is great. I have a little bit more time to talk about this today, uh, which I wasn't expecting. So I'll tell you about the story of the Tree of Life, right? Well, you all know the story. That's not what I mean. Um, so the tree of life, we know that when there's the fall of man, I'm not, certainly not going to blame women, not here. Um, we all know what happened. But there's the fall of man. And uh, what God says is, okay, we have to separate now human beings from the tree of life. And so you could say then in the beginning that human beings were designed to be immortal, that we were never designed to age. And so there was a mechanism that existed on this planet to prevent us from aging. Just like lobsters never age, planaria, hydractinia, tardigrade, these living systems. And by the way, did you notice that these living systems live in water? And they're found in seawater. So there has to be a connection there. So if a mechanism was put onto our planet to prevent human beings from aging, and it was this thing called the tree of life, is we obviously don't have this here today where we can look at it and examine it scientifically, but what we do have is the mathematical code in the story of the tree of life. So I looked at that code, and I distilled that code down into a number. And that number, when I looked into the scientific literature, was a wavelength of light that stimulated the production of telomerase. And when I looked at the compound that was responsible for that, I found it in lobsters. It all comes together. So the technology that you're going to see today incorporates all of this information, what we did was we started from very primitive, a prototype in our lab that was gigantic, it was expensive, it was functional, and we were able to do our initial studies. And then over a period of years, we began to refine this process and uh, finally put it into something that someone could use in their home. But what we want to really know is this is all intellectually interesting. What we really want to know now, though, is what effect does drinking this water have on the human body? What we want to find out is that when we drink this water, is it indeed making any change within us? And that's what we're going to take a look at. So let's go to the video. Most people think that radiocarbon has been used to date rocks. Whenever they think of radioactive dating, they think of radiocarbon because that's what they're used to hearing. But uh, radiocarbon isn't used to date rocks because most rocks don't have carbon in them. A and 
what we need is organic carbon because it's intrinsic to the, the methodology or how you understand how radiocarbon works. How does a tree then get carbon-14 in it? Well, it's simple because uh, the radiocarbon is produced in the upper atmosphere. Cosmic rays bombarding the Earth's atmosphere turns nitrogen atoms into carbon-14 atoms, which circulates into the carbon dioxide that we breathe. Mm -hmm. And so it's also taken in by the plants during photosynthesis. So it's in the wood, it's in the leaves. It's in the vegetables we eat, animals taken into their bodies. So it's in the animals that we eat. So it gets into our bodies. So not only are all these plants around us radioactive with radiocarbon, but we are ourselves. So you have it, I have it. Correct. And as long as we live, we're taking more radiocarbon okay. into our bodies. But when we die, we stop taking radiocarbon into our bodies. And so a dinosaur dies, it stops taking in radiocarbon, and then over the thousands of years it's getting less and less radiocarbon. And as I said before, you know, after 90,000 years there should be no radiocarbon left in dinosaur bones. If every atom of the earth was radiocarbon, it all would have decayed away in less than a million years. So if you already believe the fossils, dinosaur fossils, the coal beds, all those things are uh, millions of years old, you wouldn't expect to find any radiocarbon in them. And, and yet you do, and this is one of the things that we found when we studied petrified wood like this at different levels in the geologic record. I was doing research on this. I was collecting samples in, in England, in Australia, uh, and I sent them to the radiocarbon laboratories, and sure enough, they had radiocarbon in them. So this is another aspect of this whole time question, because if these things are believed to be millions of years old, like this petrified wood, and yet it has radiocarbon in it that says it's only thousands of years old, oh. then it means that it calls into question the conventional time frame. And so we wanted to test this because we'd, we'd seen in the literature, this is in the conventional literature. In the 1980s, they developed a new methodology for uh, measuring uh, radiocarbon. They could count atoms of radiocarbon. Mm. That's how, how good it was. Mm. But they wanted to be sure that they weren't getting any contamination in their laboratories. And so they took samples like petrified wood, they took samples of, of dinosaur bones and coal and oil and natural gas and, and limestone even, and they put them in their equipment and every sample they tested had radiocarbon in it. And this was reported in the literature and, and they ignored it. So mm. in our research, we decided well, we'll test that for ourselves. We wanted to be sure that you know this wasn't an artifact of of a conventional experimental method. Mm -hmm. So we selected samples uh, from 10 different coal beds around the United States, some coal beds that were conventionally as young as 40 million years, some coal beds that were conventionally over 300 million years old. And when we tested them for radiocarbon, they had radiocarbon in them, mm -hmm. and they all yielded the same radiocarbon age, which meant that these plants must have all lived at the same time and died at the same time. And that fits the flood paradigm because these would have been pre-flood trees that were all buried together at the same time. But we went further. We thought, okay, let's test out some material that's come from inside the earth that's got carbon in it. So we selected diamonds because mm. diamonds come from deep inside the earth. Remember the volcano that we were at, yes. the SP crater? Well, from inside the earth, we have these volcanic eruptions that bring diamonds up. They're made down deep inside the earth, which means the diamonds have never been in contact with the atmosphere until they're brought to the surface. Because carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere, we wouldn't expect mm. them to have any radiocarbon in them. Because also, they're the hardest substance known, so they can't be contaminated. So even when they arrive at the earth's surface, you're not going to exchange carbon-14 in the atmosphere with carbon in the diamond. So whatever the diamond brought up from the depth has been bottled up and, and locked mm -hmm. in. So we tested the diamonds. We got uh, several diamonds from Africa, and every one of those diamonds yielded radiocarbon at uh, uh, much the same age. It was detectable radiocarbon. Now, we presented this, uh, this uh, research at a, a conference, the American Geophysical Union, one of the largest bodies of, of of geologists that get together. We had a poster presentation, and unbeknownst to us, one of the scientists that saw our presentation of the, the diamond evidence 
was from a, a, a radiocarbon laboratory. So he went back to his own university radiocarbon laboratory, got his own diamonds and reported similar results to what we mm. had found. Here's, here's the sticking point. The diamonds are supposed to be between one and three billion years old. Mm. That's the conventional age. For them to be only thousands of years old flies in the face of the conventional wisdom. So again, this is an illustration. You know, we did our own sampling, got our own laboratory results, and verified what was already in the open scientific literature for several decades, whether it's petrified wood, coal, dinosaur bones, the shells of shellfish, they all contain radiocarbon, all through the fossil record. And so that tells us that these layers aren't millions of years old. When we're talking about radiocarbon, these radiocarbon results, we're talking about an earth that's only thousands of years old, we're talking about trees being buried in coal beds uh, all at the, in, in the one year during the flood, that's why they gave the same age, then that's radically different from the conventional uh, paradigm. They've excluded God from the picture. And that's why they can deliberately choose to ignore the evidence. It's not that the evidence isn't there, it's that they've choose, chosen choose to ignore it. Ignore. One of the reasons why we wanted you to see that clip was because in science, sometimes people, they hold on to a belief even when new evidence is presented. It's called being, having dogma or being dogmatic, right? I lived in California for 14 years and there used to be a saying in California is, don't let my karma run over your dogma. Um, <laughs> so it's not good uh, to hold on to a belief so strongly in science where you're not open to seeing new information. There's always new things that are being learned and we should be open to exploring these things even if it flies in the face of uh, what's long been established as scientific fact. That's the way we're going to explore and learn new things and expand. So let's take a look at this now. Previously People might have thought, well, okay, light therapy is all about stimulating the body with light with some type of device. And in our cases, it's with patches. But this idea that you could actually release light inside of the body and embed water, which goes everywhere, with light, this is an entirely new concept. And undoubtedly, there's going to be some skeptics that will say, no, that, that can't be possible, but we've actually proven that this is what's going on here. So we have a total of uh, seven human clinical studies now, and we've completed four. Uh, the fifth one will be completed, I hope, this month, and then we have another two that are in process. So we took um, the initial study that we did and learned an enormous amount of information from it. And then from there, we began to modify the study to see what else that we could learn. So in the first study that we did with this light water, do you guys like the name light water better than lobster water? Okay, all right. So the first study, what we wanted to do was cast a huge net. And we essentially wanted to find out, well, what's going on in the blood, in the urine? What's going on in the bioelectrical system in the body? Normally, when you do studies, you cast this big net the first time, and then there's little pieces of gems that come out. You don't expect that everything is going to work and kind of go from there. In this case, that's not what happened. We did a blood study with, in this first study, with dark field and bright field microscopy. That showed changes immediately after consuming this water. We did to look at changes in the metabolism. Now, I'm going to show you some of that data today. And the metabolism data was simply to look at at what rate are amino acids being metabolized and used in the body. If we want to have a technology 
that's going to upregulate mitochondrial function, alter gene expression. It's going to increase the, the rate at which we heal. We would expect to find that in metabolic data, in urine testing. So we did that, and we did find that. We had people connected to a physio suite. We looked at their heart rate, the heart rate variability. We looked at EEG. We saw changes there. We had people sitting in front of an infrared camera. And we had people drink this water. Now, what we were looking for was to see if people were in pain, and you can see the inflammation on the infrared, if drinking the water would get rid of their pain. What we didn't expect to find is that when people drank the water, we would see light coming out of their throat. And this showed up in some people on the infrared. Now, when we're, we have a new product, of course, um, we want to see how long is it going to take for people to respond to the product. So most of you are probably pretty happy that people respond to X39 in the first 24 hours, right? Yes, yes or <laughs> I thought you'd be happy about that. Okay, in this study, and bear in mind, X39 is our flagship product. So the idea here is that we can have a technology not only to stimulate the skin with light, but now to take light in the body, and the two are working in harmony. So could we see that people's results with X39 would even be faster than 24 hours? Well, we had one person in the study. We, did, we had in these four studies about 80 people. We had 80 people. One person out of the 80, after drinking the water, responded within only two minutes. Yeah, it's one person, I know. 79 out of the 80, we saw changes in the heart rate variability and the EEG in 15 seconds. <laughs> so, we were very excited about that. So, let's take a look at this now, and we want to see what happened in the urine data. So we got statistical significance, and actually, uh, Dr. Connor, Dr. Caitlin Connor, just sent an email two days ago saying on the new study that they just did, um, they got statistical significance on that. So it reaffirms the data that I'm about to show you here, and we actually learned some new things. So the first amino acid, and I want you to look at this from the perspective of looking at a pattern that's forming, because that's exactly what happened here. Each one of these amino acids that gets upregulated in the body is a sign that that amino acid is being used, but what is it telling us about exactly what's going on? So the first one is sarcosine, and uh, sarcosine, it shares properties with glycine, and what's interesting is that it's used to improve cognition. So when you drink this water, one of the effects that people report is a rush of energy up into their heads. That's sarcosine being metabolized and turning on the brain. And if you think about this another way, bioelectrically, if we're releasing light into the body, the big users of electricity in the body are the heart and the brain. The heart and the brain have massive electrical fields. So you could look at it another way. What happens is you drink the water, the light increases the electrical field and electromagnetic field around the heart and the brain, and this triggers changes in the metabolism, and we see sarcosine being utilized as a symptom of expansion of consciousness and improve brain. So, expect to have improved memory, focus, processing in the frontal lobes from drinking this water. Okay, serine is another amino acid. 
that we saw, and interestingly enough, searing is related to cognition. So here we have another pathway. So apparently when you drink this water, it makes your brain work better. What else could be going on here? Now I've got some good news for you, some great news uh, when it comes to you X39 fans, because glycine, which is used in the manufacture of copper peptide and glutathione, gets upregulated when you drink this water. That means people will get better benefits when using X39. Now, not only that, but your lifespan is directly correlated to your body's levels of glutathione. We know that copper peptide declines with age. So the higher your copper peptide levels, the longer that you live. If we had a technology that could prevent us from aging, what you would expect to find is that it would help support your body's levels of glutathione and copper peptide, and that's exactly what we found. Now, the next one was valine. How many athletes, athletic enthusiasts do we have here? I would hope that we would see all of your hands go up, but okay, you can't win them all. For those of you that aren't exercising, please exercise. Um, okay, we're gonna do some studies, by the way. We're doing some studies with this water, and we're gonna try to get exercise down to 10 minutes a week. We're gonna try to do that. So stay tuned for that. Okay. I'm serious, it's possible. Okay. So one of the signs of aging is sarcopenia, a loss of muscle. We also see, of course, a loss of bone density. The two of them are connected. And the branch chain of amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, if we had a technology that could stop, prevent, reverse aging, one of the things we would expect to find is an increase in muscle protein synthesis. That's exactly what we found. Valine metabolism gets upregulated. And also, very interesting, I don't want to make a claim about this, I'm being eyed right now, Valine is associated with lower blood sugar levels, and it's also indicative of an increase in growth hormone. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions as far as what that means to people that are going to be using the water. <laughs> I have my attorney looking at me right now saying, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. <laughs> That's our 20th anniversary, I can say it, right? All right. Um, <laughs> okay, histidine, another amino acid. And what's interesting about this is histidine uh, is part of carnosine. And of course, carnosine is composed of alanine and histidine. And we know that that is associated with longevity. So we increase our body's levels of carnosine. It's been shown to increase lifespan by 30 to 40%. So again, here we have another indicator by releasing the correct wavelengths of light inside the body, we can turn on mechanisms associated with longevity. Not surprisingly, along with histidine, we find alanine metabolism getting upregulated as well. And of course, we know alanine is not only associated with carnosine, but also AHKCU, or what we want to upregulate with X49. You drink the water, it makes X49 work better, in addition to X39. Leucine. Okay, so leucine is another branch chain amino acid. And this was the big one, because leucine turns on mTOR. And mTOR, of course, is associated with muscle protein synthesis. We're doing a study where we're going to take athletes and give them uh, hopefully the same exercise program, same amount of protein, but what we're going to do is give them this water and we're going to compare the difference in the amount of 
uh, strength, stamina, and muscle that they can gain. Uh, but what we're going to expect that we're going to find based on the results of this study is that as you continue to feed the body more protein and you have the stimulus there, that the body will gain muscle mass very rapidly. I don't, did my own anecdotal experiment with this and I'm convinced that it works. So this could end up being water with light, could end up being the most powerful anabolic ever created. There's a little bit of a market for that. Methylhistidine, um, this again is a sign that tissue is being broken down and new muscle tissue is being formed. So we have every indicator here that this product is going to be phenomenal for athletes or simply anyone that wants to push off aging. But you do have to eat right, you do have to get your essential nutrients, and uh, you do have to exercise. Proline. So if we want to stop and reverse aging, we have to reverse what happens at age 25 with us. At 25, the body begins to shut down production of collagen. So of course, by the time we get over the age of 70, it's very difficult to heal. This water upregulates collagen production. So we can expect to see reduction in lines and wrinkles. We can expect to see faster healing. Again, when all the nutrients are there. And then this was, this was a huge one, uh, which, again, this is one of these things when you do these studies, you cast a wide net, you see what you find, so it makes the studies expensive, but when everything turns out the right way, you're really excited about it. So this is the KP pathway, and this was the big one because it's indicative of an increase in NAD production in the cell. And... For those of you that aren't familiar with this, um, David Sinclair at Harvard was given about $1 billion in funding to try to find a drug to turn on NAD. Because NAD has been found, when you upregulate it, uh, can reverse at least part of aging. So again, we have another indicator here that you drink this water and it is stopping and reversing parts of human aging. And there's a lot more for us to explore here. And that's just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys want to see the machine? Let's see the video of the machine first, shall we?
Okay. Well, we're going to talk about this new technology now. And for that, I would like you to give a warm round of applause for our global VP of marketing, Mr. Wayne Moorhead. David, the excitement and anticipation around this launch uh, has been coming for a while and is truly incredible. And what's even more incredible are the results that you've seen in the studies and that we've started to hear from people as they've also started to try the water as well. And with this new technology that's really never been seen before, a lot of us, I know I do, uh, have a lot of questions and want to dig in a little bit deeper. We're very eager to learn more. So I get to represent everybody here in the audience and asking you uh, a few additional questions. Just to dig in a little bit deeper, I know we all want as much information on this product as we can. So I'd love to start off with water itself. So why is that such an ideal delivery system for this light technology and for these health benefits? Yeah, so um, when we make observations of what occurs in the human body over time with aging, we can see um, fundamentally the amount of water in the body begins to decrease. But we need, we understand that, but do we really understand the impact of what's going on there? We can look at it from a biochemistry perspective in the sense that this will lead to a decline in energy. And so by the age of 50, people start to feel the impact uh, They'll gain more body weight, lose muscle mass, lose bone density. They're tired and fatigued. All of this stems from uh, initially a reduction in water. A reason for this that I think is overlooked is the, the mechanism is that as the cells begin to shrink, the electrical charge around the cell begins to decline. So we, we think of, let's say, going from a basketball going down to a baseball. Not quite like that, but you can visualize it. So around the outside and the inside of the cell, you have electrolytes that maintain an electrical charge. And when the cells divide, and this is the part that's overlooked, when the cells divide, that electrical charge is shunted to the DNA and is used to drive, it creates an electromagnetic pulse, and it's used to drive a DNA replication. So through the aging process, when the charge around the cell membrane declines, there's less energy to transfer over to the DNA and gene expression is going to change. So if we are able to have a water to keep the body better hydrated, if that's one of the mechanisms which this water will do, uh, then we have a novel method for attacking the problem of aging. So, that, among many things, is uh, fundamental to uh, human aging. So we have to start there. If we're going to stop human aging, we have to improve upon our hydration and keeping the levels, in the, uh, levels of water in the body as high for as long a period of time as possible. Thank you. That's fascinating. So I'm curious how is this primarily different from you know, other water filtration systems, other alkaline uh, filters? What are some of the primary differences? Yeah, so this is like nothing else that exists in the market. And uh, what I was so excited about is that we got a patent very, very quickly about this. I know that you're new to LifeWave, mm -hmm. but uh, it took me uh, 11 years to get the first LifeWave patent. Wow. Uh, and then the coil technology that I showed, that was 18 months. Uh, this technology was less than one year to get a patent. It wow. happened very, very quickly uh, because the mechanism is so novel. So um, I know you're probably going to ask me some questions um, about some of the other things here, but basically what we're doing here is we're creating new matter. We're creating a type of water that never existed before. It's highly organized and structured. So you could say it's structured water, but not in the traditional sense. We're using the water as a delivery mechanism. 
So the water is a carrier of light. So you drink the water and the water goes everywhere and the light gets released everywhere in the body. And that can be measured. That is amazing. Yeah, thank you. So can you share a little bit about what's under the hood? Can you talk about the process that the water goes through the different stages a little bit? Yeah, this was, um, this was really fun working with, you know, we had two different teams of engineers, actually three. So um, we had an internal team of engineers and we had two separate companies that we had hired to take the initial uh, prototype that I had built and then convert it into something, you know, that would look nice and, uh, and sit on someone's counter. So the first thing that we do is on the left side of the machine, from looking at it this way, um, is we have a reservoir where you would put uh, two liters of water. Now you can put uh, tap water into this if you want to put clean water into it. You want to put any special water, spring water, uh, deuterium depleted water, what have you. You can put any type of water into this. And then the water will pass through uh, two separate stages of filtration that are over here. Now it took about eight to nine months for us just to develop uh, the first water stage. We, we had gone to a number of companies that specialized in water filtration, but the first stage was the most important. So we wanted to be able to eliminate heavy metals, microplastics, PFOS, PFOAs, the forever chemicals. Um, Incredible. This had to be the best filter that you could get. And so it, it took forever um, to find a company to work with, but we finally found it. Then inside there's a second stage. So if you remember correctly, what we're doing is we're taking oxygen and hydrogen and combining it into a new form of water. So through the process, the water is oxygenated, uh, but there's a second filter in there, uh, which is a carbon filter, so it further reduces any potential contaminants, although the first stage really does that. But the second stage will also put additional hydrogen into the water. So this is not a hydrogenated water product. We're putting in hydrogen because we want to combine it with the oxygen to form this new species. Um, and then in the center of the equipment is uh, where we have our black box. And uh, that's, the, uh, that's the core of the technology. So in there, we're going to have light processing units. And um, this is the proprietary system that I invented and we developed in our labs. And that is going to, uh, it takes about 45 minutes to process a uh, 16 ounce or 500 mil glass of water. Incredible. Uh, technology like nothing uh, we've ever seen before. So I'm curious, you talk, yeah, go ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you, David. So you spoke a little bit about how long it takes to kind of work its way through the, through the system from filtration to infusion. What about, let's call it dosage? You know, how long, um, how many glasses is it per day, per week, per month should someone consume? And then what are the corresponding kind of benefits with those time frames? Yeah, so everything on this machine happens through a touchpad interface. And uh, so you just simply, the screen is going to give you feedback as far as is it processing water, when do you need to change the filter, um, and so forth. And when you want to dispense, you just simply press the button, and this machine will process two glasses of water at a time. Uh, and then it's another 45-minute cycle, and then you have... Uh, another glass. So whenever you're ready to drink the water, you can, you'll just dispense it and then off you go. Now when we did our studies, it was all based on only drinking one glass per day. And actually, uh, when we first started the studies, this was something I was very concerned about because I thought, well, maybe you only have to drink like a hundred or two hundred mils, like a quarter of a glass or half a glass of water to get the benefits. So you don't have to think in terms of that you have to drink 
eight glasses a day of this water. Really, uh, I think what we're finding is that one glass is enough. Incredible. The other thing... Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that the water is going to upregulate your use of nutrition. So it's going up to regulate your need for vitamins, minerals, uh, amino acids. So if you really want to get essential fatty acids, so you want to get the best benefits of this water, um, you want to be having a healthy diet and maybe even supplement. And maybe even have a special supplement <laughs> that's designed to work with this water machine. I'm excited to learn more about that, <laughs> absolutely. So I know, uh, you know, we start to feel the benefits so quickly. What about over time? Is there a compounding effect that as someone takes it over weeks and months that, you know, it has even this kind of optimization effect with that? Yeah, so um, what we've been doing up to this point is uh, in our research, since we haven't had the machines um, to do, to, for people to take home with them, all of the studies so far have been on drinking one glass of water. What happens when you, you take a baseline reading, you take someone's blood, urine, bioelectrical readings, you give them the water and then you check back one, two minutes later on some tests, 20 minutes on another test. Uh, so that's the time frame that we've been working with. Uh, now that we're getting the machines manufactured in their final form, now the testing that we're gonna look at is the telomere testing and the genetic panels. So what we wanna know is uh, when we've done telomere testing in the past, it, you need six months to see a difference between uh, before and after. On the genetic testing, let's say it's four, six months. That would be around the window. So what we'll do essentially is take uh, 20 to 50 people in two different studies, have them take the machines home with them. They'll have a glass of water every day and then uh, we'll measure their blood and urine and bioelectrical readings over a course of six to nine months. And then we're gonna see, do these people become physically younger uh, over wow. that period of time? Can we measure that? Um, so those are gonna be important studies that we've done, which we haven't gotten to, but people would expect to see especially changes in their cognition over a period of the first few weeks of using this. And That's if they're amazing. exercising, the change in muscle growth is extremely rapid, first two, three weeks, as long as they're loading with protein. Wow, that is incredible. Yeah. Can you share a little bit more about how this works in concert with the other LifeWave products, kind of making it a, you know, one plus one equals 10, uh, you know, type of equation that I know doesn't work uh, in your world, but that's my math there, so. Uh. <laughs> marketing math, yeah, yeah that's Marketing okay. math, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna answer that. The uh, one other thing that I wanted to point out, it's Please. not on this prototype. This is uh, one of 10 prototypes that came off of uh, the lab. There's also another cartridge in here. And uh, so the filters get replaced uh, one filter gets replaced every six months, the other filter every year. But we have a cartridge where you can take a special type of supplement. I'm just getting a patent on this now. But you take a special type of supplement and you add it into the water and it actually intensifies wow. the effect. And you can get the water to go to specific parts of your body. That's um, incredible. But that's a story for a different day. <laughs> no, that's amazing. Um, so... Yeah, one of, for years, one of the things that we've done is we recommended to people stay hydrated. So when we look at the scientific literature, and this is going back 20 years, uh, one of the things that we see is that when people are in pain, part of it is a function of dehydration, part of it is a function of um, mitochondrial dysfunction, and another part is a deficiency in electrolytes like magnesium and potassium. So one of the things uh, that our LifeWave community would do is they would give people a glass of water before applying patches, and what we would find is that the um, demos they were doing on pain relief would improve in people that were dehydrated. Now, you don't have to do that, 
uh, because we find over 90% of the people that use the patches, they get pain relief. But when you have someone that's dehydrated, they won't respond to the patches, you give them a glass of water and the results improve. So we need water to manufacture energy and have flow of energy through the body and that drives everything else. When you have a water that itself contains energy, it's a game changer because it makes every other patch we have work better. It's, a, it's like a turbocharger for the patches. That's amazing. I say that. Yeah, I love how it works so perfectly uh, with all of the other products and, and actually maximizes the benefit. I think that's incredible. Um, so what are the benefits that you're most uh, excited about? I know you went into some of the, you know, the muscle loss, the cognitive, um, anti-aging. What are some of the ones that you're most excited about? Uh, have you ever seen an Italian age? Uh, you know, when I was growing up, I'm half German, half Italian. There's some Irish in there somewhere. And I had all of these old Italian relatives and all of them became overweight. Uh, my grandfather developed diabetes, Parkinson's disease, and it was a horrible thing to watch. So I think that's part of the thing that's inspired me and driven me to want to stop human aging. So I think the thing that's most exciting to me about this is that our research is showing that this is a legitimate path to stopping human aging. There, wow. every, every other benefit that you would want as a human being stems from that. Incredible. So speaking of the other benefits, what might determine whether someone experiences one benefit over another? Does it have to do with maybe deficiencies, you know, or, um, you know, other aspects of lifestyle? What might determine whether someone's going to feel, you know, it's more energy or the cognitive impacts or some of these others? Yeah, I mean, some of the benefits are going to be universal and then other benefits will depend on a person's age. Are they taking any type of pharmaceutical drugs that are generally impairing their health? Do they have a pre-existing medical condition? Um, what is their diet like? You know, just uh, the same rules would apply as what we would say, well, what experience are you going to have with the patches? Sure. Uh, so it would be this, the same type of thing. So it would really be an opportunity for people to take at their, look at their life and say, okay, well, maybe it's time to clean up my diet. Maybe I should supplement in some places where I might be deficient. I should start an exercise program or at least, you know, walk regularly, get my body moving, get proper sleep. All of these things are, are going to support our overall health. So when we add a technology like this, we can expect the best benefits. Absolutely. And I, I love that. Um, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. I, I love what you just said. Um, it seems like this is a catalyst uh, on an individual and personal level for us to make other changes as well. We know, you know, we want to optimize the benefits of this product, of the patches, of the others. And that's going to help us then and uh, really motivate us to supplement and exercise and diet, that it has all these lifestyle implications. So we've talked a lot about the overall health benefits, kind of the, the bio benefits. I'm curious, can you share a little bit about the business benefit? How you see this fitting in the portfolio of uh, all of the other incredible LifeWave products and how it helps share LifeWave with more people around the world? So this is a statement of LifeWave migrating from being a patch company to a technology company. And this is just the beginning. I, I think what I would like our community to understand is that this is the first product that's coming out of this technology. And there's other applications for the technology that we haven't talked about today. So this is going to be the embodiment where the wavelengths of light are triggering regenerative mechanisms in the body. But if we could have a technology where we could get light to go in our body and go to different places, what would that potentially mean? If we could have energy that would regenerate the heart or the kidneys or the liver, that would be incredible. We could get different cosmetic benefits from this process. And um, so, of course, I have a number of applications in mind I'm that sure. I'm not sharing right at the yes. moment. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think what would be important for all of our partners to know is that we have seven years of 
product launches planned based off of this technology. So we're, we're thinking, you know, um, as business owners, we, we want to be looking at how can we shelter ourselves from competition? How can we innovate? How can we stay ahead of the competition? How can we continue to expand our uh, money earning potential? And uh, so we're, we're thinking very far out into the future now in our planning on this. And every one of these applications uh, for this technology is cutting edge and it doesn't exist today. So we're, we're going to continue to have new and innovative things with phenomenal benefits and you can't get it any other place but LifeWave. Amazing. Well, I'm excited to hear that this is just the beginning of the application of that technology. I'm super excited uh, to get one of these in my home as well uh, after the launch. And David, I just want to thank you for developing this technology, for bringing it to the world, and for allowing us to help share it with everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Appreciate it's really it. a pleasure. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Wayne Moorhead, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Now it's time for me to ask something of all of you. Uh-oh. Boy, it's dead silent. <laughs> Don't be nervous. This isn't a bad thing. Um, when, <laughs> when we were planning out this conference, we were coming up with all different types of ideas, and my staff said to me, what do you want to do to celebrate 20 years? That's a big question. So I thought about it, and the first thing that came to mind was, I want to watch Star Trek with our brand partners. <laughs> and so my idea was to have a Star Trek marathon. Thursday night Star Trek, Friday night Star Trek, Saturday night Star Trek. That's what I wanted to do. And fortunately, saner minds prevailed. And uh, Jim and I came up with this idea for the drone show. We came up with, Jim and I planned out. <laughs> A round of applause for Jim Caldwell, please. That was phenomenal, wasn't it? And then, of course, we got the opportunity to have the original Blues Brothers, so we couldn't say no to, no to that. And if you haven't guessed, we have some, an amazing performer coming in on Saturday night. Not going to say who it is. You better show up. Uh, and we needed to give you guys tonight off so you can spend time with your teams. So no Star Trek. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I need to compromise a little bit here. We could watch an entire episode together, together, right? Uh, but then we had all these amazing speakers. We had to show the water machine. We've got more surprises coming. No Star Trek. So we found a way to fit in four minutes of Star Trek. So I picked one clip from the original series with William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, DeForest Kelly, Jimmy Doohan. I picked one clip. It's an episode called The Doomsday Machine. It's a really fun episode. So for our 20th anniversary, if you would indulge me, let's watch this clip from Star Trek together. Thank you. Somewhere, sir. I almost lost you. It'll never work like this. It's the main junction circuitry. I'll get it. Bridge. Transporter malfunction. 
Transporter is out, Captain. You'll have to stand by. I can't. Power level's dropping too fast. You'd better hurry. Acknowledged. Mr. Scott, the speed is of the essence. Operational, but this jury rigging won't last for long. He's got to come off now. I'll stand by here. 1,500 miles in closing. Captain, transporter operational, but just barely. Prepare to beam me aboard on my signal. <laughs> 1,000 miles in closing. Transporter, stand by. Steady by, sir. Scott, 20 seconds to detonation. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Try inverse phasing. everybody <laughs> good morning to you well here i am the 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 latest innovation it's not water it's not paint patches it's i've beamed in what could be uh, more advanced than i've left some mitochondria back there but i'll pick it up when i beam out we're gonna try to get you some mitochondria bill but they love you here, and thank you so much for being here with us today on our 20th anniversary. What a privilege. Well, uh, it's, a privilege uh, it's a privilege of mine. Uh, I beam out and beam in wherever I can, of course. Uh, that's, those pictures are, uh, I don't know, 60 years old? So here I am 60 years later, still beaming in and beaming out. <laughs> You know, when we spoke last, you said something to me that was absolutely incredible, that is so relevant to our entrepreneurs. And it was how when you were first getting started, the only possibility for your life was to be an actor. What you said was so beautiful. 
Um, well, then say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they'd rather have you say it. Well, <laughs> say it. I, I must have said something along the line <laughs> that I never considered any other profession. I was six years old and had a camp play and uh, things they wrote for me to say uh, made the audience cry. And my father picked me up and said, uh, this is my boy, Bill. And at six to look up to an audience and my God, I made them cry and my father loves me. And so I never thought of anything else but being an actor. It never occurred to me to do anything else. Uh, that's a gift and probably a curse as well. Well, yes, that's exactly what you said. It was in the context of you had gotten off of uh, Star Trek in the 60s and some people thought you would be typecast and you wouldn't be able to get another role. And I asked you, you know, how did you get through those difficult times? Did you ever think about giving up on acting? Yeah. Well, there, th there was a time uh, when people who were popular in television series, um, when the series was over, uh, the people who uh, cast and hired must have thought that's enough of that for a while. <laughs> so, you know, it took two, three years for you to get, to, to attach yourself to that popularity. As it turns out, they were wrong. And um, an actor by the name of Steve McQueen was in a, in a series and he went right into big movies and they suddenly everyone thought, oh, well, you can go right into big movies. So that idea waned and, and, and left us. Um, I, I, when I finished Star Trek, I, I put together theatrical productions and toured in theatrical productions of one thing or another and uh, made my way along. And, and finally, uh, I was involved in television and television series and of course other movies. Uh, but the idea of giving up never occurred to me. And uh, that may be stupid and not uh, <laughs> resilient because so many people in so many professions, but particularly I'm aware of actors in the show business go through um, a period in their lives. You know that book called Passages uh, that was written and you have your dreams when you're 20 and you affect your dreams when you're 30 and you go through passages. Well, it occurred to me that actors with all that dreams of the 20, not many actors can fulfill themselves of what their dreams are. There isn't room and there isn't talent, I guess. So when do you make that decision to stop being what you're doing and try uh, being a, a dishwasher or, or something else? The tragedy of holding on too long is equal to the tragedy of letting go too soon. And what the formula is as to when to do what that's a personal choice and nobody knows the answer to it. So you had this uh, beautiful thing to say about people's lives are music being written, their story is being written, and certainly as you look back on your career, it's, you've become iconic and you've accomplished so much in your life. And you look at this like a song being written or a book being written. Well, you know, I do. Uh, I, I, um, I have uh, professed the idea, not an original one, but something that makes a great deal of sense to me, is that we are writing our book of life. We, we are living and writing our book of life. My appearance here this morning and learning about that water, and, and I know a great deal, well, I know a great deal about hydration because if I don't hydrate enough, um, uh, you feel weak and dizzy and, and then just some water, <clears throat> some water re-energizes you and you realize your body works on certain principles. These are the things you learn as you go along and, and, 
and when to know what's valid for you and what's not valid for you is a personal choice. For example, that water machine, which sounds like a great idea. I'm fully cognizant of hydration. I have felt the weakness of lack of hydration. I've done some study of <clears throat> mitochondria <clears throat> and its energetic propul propulsion of cellular life. I'm acquainted with all that and try and lead my life with that knowledge. What I guess I'm saying to you is we all need to continue our education, personal education, and make decisions on our life based on what it is we're acquiring. We're not born with this knowledge. We have to acquire it. So things like what you are doing, this new technology that we're all on the lip of, the, the, as we all know, technological advance in the next 10 years will be profound. Uh, things are going to change everywhere, society, business, everything is going to change given these advances in science. My being with you today uh, is just the beginning of a personal appearance, for example. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to come to Australia to talk. It wasn't in my schedule, but using this technology, I beamed into Australia and talked and, and had fun with a group of people for uh, half an hour. It's new technology, new knowledge that will uh, propel us and we must be aware and stay, stay aware of stuff like you're talking about this morning. And of course, we love this hologram technology and we're using it today where we're now here in Dallas and you're in California. We've done meetings where I was in Florida and gave a presentation in South Korea. What, what are some, you know, you love to look towards the future and I know you're a fantastic writer. Um, what's something about the future that you're really looking forward to that maybe we don't have today? Well, I'm of a certain age and uh, gosh, I, I was uh, at lunch with my granddaughter yesterday and I'm saying to her, you know, uh, if, if we're going to talk, if we're going to uh, share any secrets of our life, uh, I'm saying to my granddaughter, you better do it now because I never know when. <laughs> On the other hand, the possibilities of extending life to 110, 120 are very real. Uh, we're almost there. And I'm very healthy and, and, um, and if I could avail myself of this new technology of these life forces that are being invented and, and being uh, uh, administered, if I could avail myself of it, I'm going to. Uh, so I'm deeply involved in companies like yours uh, and like this because it's the future and it's tantalizingly there. We're just there. We're, we're uh, making it. AI is just coming in. We have no idea of what uh, artificial intelligence is going to do to our, our, our lives, our social and personal and business and uh, romantic lives. We have no idea what's about to happen. We have some conjecture but it changes every day. Well, I think speaking for the LifeWave community, we would like to keep you around for many, many years to come. Well, hand, 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 hand me a glass of water uh, right we, away. Uh, we will get, Bill, we will get you a water machine. Yeah, Absolutely. So thank you for spending time with us. What a gift for you to be here. Thank you so much it's for my being here pleasure. with us. What a wonderful company you have working on the edges of technology the way you are. Thank you Thank so you much. Very much. Thank you. William Shatner, everybody.
I don't know if, I thought he was gonna beam out. <laughs> ah, there he goes, okay. Not quite as dramatic as, you know, there were so many questions. We had a limited amount of time. There were so many questions that I wanted to ask him that I didn't get a chance to ask. You know, for example, like in episode 35 of Star Trek, <laughs> when him and Spock were trying to break into the safe, what was the combination to the safe? I really wanted to know that. When he was TJ Hooker, he went from being the captain of a starship to driving a police car. So I wanted to know, what did that feel like? Did it feel like being demoted? I don't know. These are questions I will never have answered. But anyway, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to have this time, have William Shatner as uh, someone from LifeWave's past, who we did a TV show with, being able to be with you all here today for our 20th anniversary. So we're gonna take some uh, announcements now and then we'll take a break for lunch and come back in the afternoon. We have some more big surprises for you. Thank you everyone, it's been a wonderful morning, thank you. <laughs>